to see everyone here, and I'm really impressed by the stamina on day five of the conference goers. It's impressive making it all the way through to day five. Um, and we've had a number of leaders um, from Netflix experimentation and machine learning and whatnot here at the conference, so I hope you've had a chance to network with them, folks like Tony Dubara, who leads our core machine learning research on personalization algorithms and other customer-facing algorithms. And then we've got um, Todd Holloway, who leads the part of my group in Beverly Hills, focusing on fascinating problems around the content catalog and how to really design the catalog in ways that can satisfy the tastes of our 83 million plus members around the world. And also how to make investment decisions and optimize our original productions and things like that. Um, and then we've got a number of folks also from our uh, machine learning engineering group here. Eves Raymond, pardon? You can't, oh, you can't hear. No. Oh. All right. Okay, is that better? Um, uh, so anyhow, hopefully you can stop by the booth that's open until 1.30 if you haven't had a chance to network with folks. So I chose this topic today to focus on the time dimension, how we handle the time dimension in various data science applications. I chose the topic not because I think Netflix does anything particularly unique or that I have like a, a brand new you know, way to kind of handle time, but more because I personally have found it a useful construct, construct during the course of my career to almost separately think about time in each application um, and consider uh, both the details and uh, myopic considerations that are really important in handling time um, uh, meticulously, but also the creativity that's involved in thinking about signals that are sort of time-oriented signals or how you might tweak um, or find variants of signals that are based on different ways of handling time. And so I've found it a fascinating sort of thread. I'm sure all of you grapple in all of your applications with various um, aspects of the time dimension. If you're not a Netflix member, this is just a screenshot of the homepage. This is actually my homepage. You can get a voyeuristic uh, experience looking at what I've been watching or what my tastes are um, from looking at this page. We, of course, have many different algorithms that come together to form the personalization on the page. It's not just one master algorithm that, that rules them all. And many of the rows on the page have a distinct algorithm behind them. One of those is this continue watching row. And I'm going to focus on this row for, for a few minutes here and the algorithm underlying that. So first let's talk about kind of the training and the problem formulation here. If this is a picture of one member, maybe my uh, viewing history over some period of time and the columns, let's call those different days or di perhaps different sessions uh, of, of, of viewing things on Netflix, I'm going to train this model uh, by, by selecting a sample of plays on a certain day, like that vertical um, dotted line. And I want to select from plays that were, were uh, continuations of some, some title I had started watching before but had not completed. So that's the consideration set. And then I'm going to form my positive examples by the title that I did play um, from among my past plays. And then the negative examples will be the titles that I had started watching before but I did not choose to watch on that particular day. So that's kind of the general framework we're using for setting up this predictive model. The goal of the model is to predict what I'm going to watch next in terms of, of continuing um, to watch titles and I want to and I want to rank those um, in that continue watching row. So that's really the goal of this model. So a couple of obvious things around time that are, that are certainly true in any application. How far should I go back? You know, if I watched something six months ago um, and the last time I watched it was actually six months ago, is there a chance that I'll pick that up and start watching again? How far back should I go? So certainly some model tuning around that, that aspect of time. And then as with any data uh, uh, scenario, we're trying to think about, okay, wh what's the time frame for our sampling altogether? Do we want to look at all of Netflix history? Do we want to look at more recent history and use that for our sampling? Because, um, of course, the catalog changes a lot over time, and that could impact um, how, how people are choosing what to continue to watch and those patterns that we're picking up in our algorithm. And, uh, of course, things about the product have changed, too, over time. The way that, con that continue watching is represented in the user interface has shifted over time as well. Um, and then the user base has shifted. So there's a lot to think about, of course, in any application around that time frame. We also have little details in this model, like how should we think about um, sequential viewing? Let's say I told you these first few, these first four episodes of Stranger Things were episodes one through four, and then on the next uh, two days later, when I watched Stranger Things again, maybe I picked up again at episode three. So perhaps I fell asleep, 
or perhaps somebody else joined me and now I'm watching together with someone else. There are any number of scenarios. But should we do something creative to try to handle that and uh, to clean up our data set? Um, so I love thinking about signals. And one of my favorite phases of, of foraying into a new algorithm is thinking about the signals and brainstorming what signals you should even try in the model. And over, over my career, I've found it extremely useful to really uh, distinctly think about signals that have to do with frequency and that have to do with recency. And for many models, you may not have separate categories for those that really let you think it through. But I have found that if you think about those two categories, you can come up with variations um, of other signals that you might be considering that have to do with tweaking those two elements. And many, many models um, will end up picking up on these signals that are, that are frequency and recency based. So I'm a huge fan of doing that. In this case, these are some examples of some of the th signals we might think about ahead of time for predicting uh, this continue watching scenario. On recency, the obvious you know, straightforward elapsed time since the last view of the title. You may think about Netflix visit days because you may not want to count the elapsed time when I wasn't even paying attention to Netflix at all. Um, and then there are things like the recency rank that could be interesting across all the titles I've watched in the past. What, it, what has been that past ranking of that viewing sequence? And then on the frequency or intens intensity space, there are a ton of things we can do there um, in, in terms of interesting and creative signals. Uh, I love thinking about time lapses in between things and then other measures of intensity. Um, and in this case, in this model, there are a lot of other signals that are interesting too. Time of day, day of week, uh, fraction of the title completed so far. Propensity to complete shows, you know, some members really like to snack on things and move around a lot rather than really digesting a full show or a full season of a show. Um, so those are many of the considerations. Now in the next slide, I'm going to show you uh, partial, res partial results from a GBM model that was uh, trained just, uh, you know, in the, in the way I described in ter terms of setting up the problem um, and then just using the time-based signals. And so maybe you could sort of take a look at this list and in your mind think about your favorite signal or two or where do you think that you know, the power in this model is really going to come from in terms of the time signals. If anybody feels really brave, you can shout out if you have a strong favorite. No? All right. Um, so here's what we see in the relative influence plot. And that title recency rank um, really is capturing a lot of the, uh, the predictive explanatory power here. Um, one thing I find kind of interesting in these results is that the hours, the raw hours since the last view is still providing some additive power beyond what we're getting from that title recency rank. And um, when we look at the partial dependency plots for the, those two particular predictors, um, you can see some interesting stuff like that title recency rank. It really is just that, that most recent title viewed that's really getting picked up there. Um, and then the hour since the last view of the title has these nice little plateaus that are just picking up um, the daily kind of aspect of, of watching. Other things I think are somewhat interesting are that on the frequency side of things, this fraction of titles, uh, fraction of days that the title was viewed in one week is picked up, but so is the fraction of days um, that the title was viewed in a month, right? So kind of getting at more of that history, which really resonates with me personally. I'll, I'll take a, a, a show like Friends, and occasionally I'll watch one episode of that because I know I'm not going to get sucked in and watch, you know, stay up all night watching it. I just want one light thing to take my mind off of the stresses of the day versus times when I really am wanting to immerse in a title and devote a lot of time to it. Um, the day of week uh, and, and time of day signals, um, if there's power there, you know, it's getting picked up in the other correlates. So we're not really seeing that pop separately. I'm going to turn now to uh, some other examples in the experimentation space. And hopefully all of you are fortunate enough to have a great experimentation practice in whatever you do and the opportunity to test your algorithms um, because, of course, that's the better way to get at causality um, and a much purer way, especially if you can truly run um, a clean experiment. Now, the challenge in running a, a clean experiment is formidable, and uh, it's something that continues to fascinate me over time, how really, truly hard and how, how hard it is to make it really clean and pure and how, um, how much detail you need to think through to do that. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of our um, time-based experimentation things at Netflix. So um, a Netflix member signs up and then goes through this process of having a free trial for the first month. 
and then we have our billing cycle once every 30 days. Our core overall evaluation criterion for our um, member product testing is retention, month over month retention. And so we run our experiment, experiments typically for several months so that we can get a read on that retention. We do have shorter term metrics that are correlated um, with retention that we measure ongoing, of course, as well. Um, but we had to think long and hard about if we're going to measure this experiment along the way, every day along the way, let's say, um, we need to be able to handle all the different scenarios of, of membership so that we can accurately measure that retention. So if someone signs up and cancels, they still have service uh, until their billing cycle comes up. What do we do with that period? So we, we decided to handle that as a cancellation because someone did request to cancel, and that's a pretty clear signal that they're not happy. Um, they might revoke that cancel. So if we're, if we're measuring the experiment sort of in that period where they've, uh, they've canceled, we're still going to call them not retained. But then later, when we measure the experiment a bit later, we'll call them retained again. And then um, we have this other scenario where somebody cancels and then makes it past their billing period, so they're completely canceled. But then they rejoin. <laughs> what do we do with those folks? Did they rejoin because the test experience you know, kind of had an impact on that? We decided no, that the test ex experience you know, would have had a bigger impact on them canceling in the first place, and we're going to ignore this, this scenario. And then another scenario is a payment failure upon the billing cycle. What do we do about that? Um, so again, the point here is just the, the meticulous attention and consistency of coming up with all of these scenarios um, in whatever framework you're in to be super careful about, about how you're going to look at the experiment at a point in time. And then another thing for us is we, we have many event-based sampling or allocation um, types of allocations in our testing. And our, our, the biggest example of that is in our new member testing, where we prefer to test uh, with members who are just signing up to Netflix. And that means that in order to accumulate the sample, a sample size that's adequate, we need to, to continue sampling over a period of time. So we'll, we'll sample sometimes for a couple of weeks, depending on the particular test and the segment that we're, um, that we're really working with for our target audience. And, um, and that means we have this sort of staggered, you know, offset um, joining into the test. And we've decided to look at consistent measurement windows in order to handle that. Because you could imagine that you could um, just look at the test at any point in time and take everybody there. We do that, but we prefer in sort of our, quote, final results in an experiment, we really try to look at, wait until everyone sort of completed a certain window and then look at that whole window of time. It can get more complex if we're running um, experiments where we're focusing on title launches, because now we have another event date that, that's kind of in there in the mix, along with our, our test sampling dates. Um, so there's a lot to think about there as well around these time windows and how to aggregate everything and get it in line. Of course, we're somewhat inoculated in experimentation because of if you have awesome, huge, random sampling, um, ideally, most of these things would be equal across the test cells, so we're OK. But you may lose some sensitivity or other things. So just, again, the, the precision that's needed is, is my point, um, being deep and meticulous. A totally different experimentation um, scenario that I want to talk about is this series of testing that we did on paid search terms. Um, for example, you might search for internet TV or streaming movies. There are a lot of other types of search terms that would matter to a company like Netflix, like specific title searches, brand searches, et cetera. Um, so we were trying to learn you know, which search terms are worth investing in, which of those really lead to better signups um, with Netflix. And because we can't control uh, handing that experience to specific members or potential members, uh, we, we couldn't really run a true A-B experiment. So we ran a quasi-experiment where, uh, where we're essentially using causal inference, right? And so we, we do this uh, in this example through different regions that we've selected as regions that can be compared with one another in terms of their sign-up trends. So there's sort of some a priori analysis to come up with what are the regions that Netflix is live in where we're observing sign-ups. And when we analyze that time series of the signups, we can see a strong relationship between multiple countries. And then we'll select a country or a set of countries as the control regions, um, and then select a country or set of countries as the uh, test regions. And this, many, many companies have done this. This is not a new thing. But the way it works is then you have your starting point for your experiment. And then now that you've identified that these countries have similar sign-up patterns, 
Um, you, you build a model that's going to predict, uh, let's say region B is our test region or t set of test regions. We're going to predict what the sign-up um, would have looked like given that we know what the sign-ups in region A are and we know that relationship historically. So we're going to build a prediction and then we're going to uh, have some confidence bounds around that prediction over time. Um, and that model is very similar to a model that's been published by Google. Uh, in, they have a nice R package called Causal Impact. It's a state space model. We have a slightly different version of it just because of the types of tests we wanted to run um, that didn't quite fit in that model. Um, but that's a great package and we hope to open source our version soon too and it, has, it just satisfies some slightly different use cases. Um, so we have our prediction and then what we're going to do is we're going to observe the actual signups that happen. Um, once we're running our experiment, and we're going to see if those actual signups fall outside of our confident, our predicted, you know, confidence bounds around our prediction. So, um, what we did in this particular round of tests was we decided we wanted to have this on-off cycle in terms of having these paid search terms out there um, because we wanted to increase the power of the test, right? And so, with each off on-off cycle, we get an extra degree of freedom, and we get a more powerful test under our belt. So we came up with this as our first version of this test, this on off, uh, three days on, three days off. And in the control regions, we just kept the paid search terms on the entire time. Um, here are the results. Let me orient you to how to look at this. On the y-axis, we have the, the actual signups versus predicted signups from the model. And then on the uh, x-axis is the date. The red vertical lines are the points in time when we turn search off. And the green lines are when we turn search back on. Um, and then the blue line that's charted are the actual signups. And the red are the predicted signups with the, with the gray confidence bound. And we initially saw this result that was really perplexing, right? Because what we're seeing <laughs> is that with significance, um, the signups are going up when we turn search off. And so we scratched our heads and we thought, well, you know, we're still trying to tune this new model. Maybe it's the model. Maybe it's the regions. Maybe our initial identification of these like control and test regions was really not uh, the best set of regions. And maybe after that you know, training period of time, they diverge for other reasons. So, so we went back to the drawing board and we thought, well, also it could be this on-off window. Maybe we got that um, wrong. So we constructed an, another bunch of tests um, where we used different on-off windows and different regions. And we came up with many more regions, uh, trained the models to, to build the predictions uh, across all these different regions and uh, ran this series of tests. And this really taught us a lot. In this case, um, we still saw that strange result when we looked at the shorter three days on, three day off window. But when we looked at some of the on longer windows, um, the results made a lot more sense. So here you can see, although we're not outside of our confidence bounds, we are seeing that signups are going down directionally when search is off, right? So at least this result is holding um, together. After learning that, we were able to run other tests where we did get more significant results, um, and that was exciting. So we just learned a lot by kind of playing with this time window and, uh, and, figure, and tuning the model around um, some of the other aspects of the timing. Another example I want to talk about is really more about measurement of consumption patterns. Netflix, uh, a couple of months ago, published a PR um, article about binging, and it published this thing it called the binge scale. And it had shows to savor, shows to devour, essentially getting at, you know, how quickly do people gobble up um, the different types of shows that are on Netflix. And uh, binging has been written, out, written about quite a bit at Netflix and is very fun to think about in my opinion. Here's a deeper look at that same data that was used for that PR study where along the x-axis I've just sorted the show, these serialized shows, I think there were 100 or 101 or something, sorted them. Um, by the hours per day spent watching the show. So you can see this nice little cluster at the head of some of the shows that are really devoured more so than the other shows. Now the way this was done was just based on people who completed the show. So it's a subset of the audience and you know when you when you turn it to a team like ours who, who want to think about things more deeply we're not super excited about thinking in the simplistic way about binging. So um, uh, so you know, we've thought a lot over the years about, about binging in general. 
And these are some of the possible uses. If we were able to really do a great job measuring binging, how would we use that information, right? We may want to use it to inform the catalog-wide planning. Should we have a variety of shows? Should we always have a couple of shows that people, can bin that people like to binge in different genres, et cetera? Like you can imagine how, how catalog-wide it would be useful information. And then it may be true that if we can understand the value of binging to particular individuals or the value of binging over the course of their tenure, et cetera, it could be interesting as input to the recommend, recommender system. Those are some of the ideas around binging. What I really want to talk about, though, is how complicated it is to really study this. Um, I'm going to use the same kind of diagram here where uh, I'm looking at one member's viewing over time. And each column is either a day or a session or however you want to think about that. <clears throat> so if I watch three episodes of Orange is the New Black in one sitting, is that a binge? If I watch five, do I need to watch more episodes in order to call that a binge? What about if I you know, inter put a little episode of Friends in the middle of there? Is that, am I still binging Orange is the New Black or because I broke it up, am I no longer binging? What about across days? Like, would I call that whole thing a binge or would I call that two binges? What if I separate the days? What if I watch the in-between, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and then what if I look like this? <laughs> this, how many of you look like this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. There, this is not an uncommon scenario among uh, viewing behavior at Netflix where people are just watching a tremendous amount of stuff and watching multiple shows at once. So, so are all of those things binges? Are all of those sessions binges, right? That's, that's the question. A deeper uh, way that we've looked at this um, at one point, and please don't read anything into our catalog based on this because this is uh, slightly older data and frankly not that easy to interpret the way I'm showing it here, um, but is to break down you know, sort of the different facets of a binge. One facet is completion. So what on, on the um, left chart here, you've got um, commitment and completion, which are range from zero to one or zero to 100%. So completion is, you know, for any given show, what percentage, if you watched any of the show, what percentage of the show did you complete? Um, and we have a nice histogram there to kind of think about that. And then commitment would be, of, if, of, of people who watched any uh, amount of the show, what percentage of the view was uninterrupted by other titles, regardless of how much time it took to watch. And then we separately broke out thinking about the time or the speed of, of ingestion into two indices. And we use indices to try to get this personalized nature of, of um, your viewing pattern. And so what we did with, say, the daily viewing speed was to try to say, did you watch this particular title more quickly um, than you normally do within a session? So if you normally spend two hours in a, in a Netflix visit day watching content, um, when you were watching this show, did you spend three hours? So we tried to benchmark it against that normal pattern. Similarly, with days to view, we did the same thing. We said, OK, if you typically watch n hours of Netflix in a month, um, uh, and then given the runtime of this particular show, how long would we expect it to take if you watched it at your normal rates to consume the show? And then we um, and ind indexed uh, that the viewing of a particular show against that, right? So if you watched it more quickly than normal, we could call that a binge, perhaps. So I think something like this is a more complete way to think about binging. It's even more complex, though, because you have to think about you know, member tenure. <laughs> if I've only been a Netflix member for 10 days, what's my opportunity to really binge? Um, if I want to benchmark against some of those things like I was talking about, I need to have a longer tenure even to form my benchmark. Should we do this at the show level or the season level? Um, that's confusing too, right? Uh, because if we have five seasons of one show on Netflix and one season of a different show on Netflix, how do we stack those things and get those normalized, normalized to one another? Um, Runtime gets in the mix as well as repeat views. So there's just a ton to think about to really be good um, at measuring binging in a deep way. One, of my, one approach I think is interesting is sort of an anomaly detection approach. You can imagine that being useful, but you still have some of these complexities um, of tenure and things like that that get in the way. I want to wrap up with just um, thinking about how humans perceive time and how might we mix that into the kinds of work that we all do. And there's been a lot of uh, neuroscience research as well as psychological research around time and how we all experience time. And one of the themes is captured in, in here around how as we age, time speeds up. And why is that? It's because so much of the world is familiar to us. And we're doing repeated tasks. And, and we've encountered all the, 
types of human beings in the world. And so you meet somebody new, and you're like, oh, yeah, that person's just like these three other people I knew. <laughs> Maybe it's not that bad. But you know, we, we experience things that are familiar, and so time speeds up. And um, some of the things that are out there in multiple articles, uh, if you do a search on you know, how, to, how to slow down your perception of time, you can actually do things specifically to slow down your, your feeling of time, your experience of time. If you haven't tried anything, these things, I recommend it. it actually, they do actually work to make you feel like time is slowing down. Um, the biggest one really is doing something new or getting way out of your comfort zone, learning an entirely new skill, going to an entirely different location anything that brings a brand new um, variety into your life. Avoiding multitasking, um, disconnecting from technology, which is probably not very realistic. Um, <laughs> and then, and then um, creating a little space around activities so that you, your brain can process and, and even just kind of think about the activity, rather, whether it's before or after the activity, that can slow things down too. So how might we think about those concepts in our work? One is in recommender systems or other opportunities where we can promote diversity. That's one way we might enable people to experience a longer period of time on a task that's enjoyable. Another is um, perhaps encouraging the focus, right? So if, if um, somebody's doing an enjoyable task, uh, don't distract the, them with all this other stuff coming at them from the website. Let them really immerse themselves in that task. Padding the positive experiences with time to reflect. Um, this is one where Netflix has certainly done the opposite. You know, you finish an episode and you are right into that next episode. <laughs> um, but you know, there is opportunity perhaps for some applications to think about how to pad these positive experiences with more time. And then um, just in our measurement, right, how can we measure the quality time versus just raw time? Uh, an example at Netflix is our core engagement metrics is streaming hours, uh, is streaming hours rather than total time spent on the site which would in, could include streaming, but we focus on the time that people are spending watching things. Um, and then for the opposite scenario where, where people are doing some, some task that's not desirable way to just spend their time, we can sort of try to speed up that experience, at least their perception of that experience, by, uh, by making the task very familiar and repeatable and not messing with people, forcing them to learn something new, not changing the website often, you know, get it into a consistent state and just keep it there and let people hammer through that task. So those are just some ideas on, on the time perception. Uh, and that's all I have. I want to acknowledge a couple folks who did some of the work that I, these are folks from my team who did some of the work that's in the slides. And I'll take any questions. I can take general questions that are uh, not about this presentation about Netflix and any, any kind of questions. Yeah. Um, uh, I use Netflix quite a bit, so I really enjoy this talk. Thank uh, you. Just curious, from Netflix perspective, do you want to encourage binging or do you not really want to encourage binging in the sense it's content, it's bandwidth, and so on and so forth? Thank you. Yeah, great question. Do we, do we think binging is a good thing for members or not a good thing? And uh, we have actually somebody who's, oh, he's not here today, actually. Um, somebody on our team has actually tried to study the relationship of binging with retention. Because of all those complexities that I mentioned around measuring it and measuring it at points in time in tenure, it's not a super, we haven't gotten a super clear signal on that. And we hypothesize that it's really variety that matters more than the binging. So if you, you know, uh, we, we do hear tales um, on blogs and whatnot of people having to quit their Netflix subscription because they're binging too much and it's getting in the way of their life. <laughs> so there are scenarios where it's not a good thing, um, but I think there are also equally positive scenarios. So we, you know, we don't have any proof either way. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I have two questions. Hi. First one on the quasi experiment, because Netflix is venturing into a lot of new markets place for say like Asian markets. Uh, how do you actually club signups over there? I, I'm assuming that you don't have much of a traffic there. So how long do you run the test? And within Asia, we have India, China, Nepal, Bangladesh, which might look similar, but the viewing patterns might diverge a lot based on the content. So mm -hmm. how do these experiments get uh, executed there? Yeah. And the next question is on the binge watching, just being solely a binge watcher. There's a time when Netflix recommendation was totally trustworthy in terms of aligning to my interest. And off late I started seeing like a lot of promotion, original content promotion. 
So that's just when I'm thinking like, okay, there's too much of promotion of original content that doesn't align with my interest. Stranger things happened. So you <laughs> continued. So how do you make the trade-off of to what extent you promote your own content versus something that closely aligns with the user interest? <laughs> Okay, great. Both, both great questions. So the first question is, what do we do about regions that have uh, smaller trickle of signups or newer regions that we don't have a lot of historical data to, to run something like this quasi-experiment? And the answer is, we just don't experiment on those regions. Like, you know, you don't have enough robust data. What are you going to do? We're, we just don't test in those regions. And, you know, it's tough when you're launching a new region. You have so much to learn and so much to get good at, and you're still building up the data. So fortunately, we have some learnings from uh, a variety of other regions that have gotten to success that we're trying to apply. But a lot of it's judgment-based at this point, and then you, then you wait and learn, right? Um, your second question, you know, how much do we promote Netflix original content is essentially what you're saying versus the purest view of recommendations that are um, purely based on titles you know about that you will love. And it's, it's a blend and it's an area we're learning about. You probably observed that as a member that we're trying to learn how to best mix that. Now it's an interesting scenario because now that we are producing a lot of original content, that's essentially unknown IP to the world. And so we now have a, an additional job that we didn't have before. You know, we used to have the job of, oh, oh, we would presume that you would know about the titles that you want to watch because you've heard about them and they've been out there in the world elsewhere. Um, so really, we're trying to showcase those titles to you. Now we're trying to do that and make you aware of other titles that we think you might enjoy. And I would say we're... You know, we're, we're not super early on in that trajectory, but we're still in the phases of learning how to really get it right in terms of that balance. And, uh, and you know, techniques like explore, exploit, and that kind of stuff can really help in learning quickly. And so when we first launch a new title, we may not quite get the target audience, right? And we try to adjust that. But it's, it's still an area that we're, that we're trying to get great at, yeah. Yes? Hi, I have a question about organizational dynamics at Netflix. Sure. Um, <laughs> So when one of your data scientists finds an interesting insight that could improve the user experience, what's the process like for putting that in production? And do you have any advice for other organizations? Yeah, organizationally, I do feel that we're very, very fortunate at Netflix because the company was really you know, founded on the idea of data and machine learning and things like that from the get-go. And so um, because of that, it's really baked into um, the executive population at Netflix and things like that. And so it's really, you have you don't have to sort of sell the idea of, of leveraging a good model and things like that, whereas I think in a lot of other companies, it's not quite that scenario. I think it, it's certainly getting better across the board from people I've talked with. And I, I think across the board, companies are much more savvy now about realizing the benefit of, of leveraging machine learning or analytics and other, other data-driven kinds of applications. So. But, um, but you know, essentially we have, we have discussion forums where people can come and share uh, with a nice little pre-read memo <laughs> that, that articulates perhaps your offline results in a model or if it's an analysis that you've done based on a predictive model, you know, you could you have a forum for writing that up in a, mem in a memo and everyone reads the memos before coming to the forum and that's a great opportunity and, and the presence um, at that forum is strong in terms of leadership as well as people who have done the direct work and so there's a, there are a lot of eyeballs on the work and a lot of people get to hear the idea and so the energy just sort of happens naturally you know when something's obviously going to be a benefit there's really no challenge in in getting it um, implemented yeah question. okay I have a question related, related to uh, how do you look at the geolocation I mean you know where your customers coming from uh -huh. and what's are their age and gender and uh, what time during the day they're watching is it because we have like students uh, education so our idea, maybe if we can target the time the students are watching Netflix to send them information about their courses also. <laughs> <laughs> you want to use Net Netflix as an educational platform. <laughs> Great. Yeah, we've had that idea come to us many times over. Um, one thing I'll say blanket is we really don't use demographics. Um, the viewing data and the beha other behavioral data is so much richer. And anytime we've done, uh, and, and, and we continue to per periodically check in on this because so many people, like say from the marketing group or other groups that, that love using demographics, want to know, you know, what's the recommended system doing with this population. So we'll occasionally find a sample where we can collect that data and do that. But we never find any benefit at all. And in fact, if anything, trying to get in the mix with some of that um, 
labeled demographic data just uh, messes things up. The, the, the pure behavioral data is, is much more successful for us. Um, but time of day, day of week things, th those are interesting signals around time, contextual time signals that, um, that we do continue to evolve in the recommender system. Yeah. Now the educational platform thing is a more of a strategic decision and that's a tough one that we've, we've contemplated at times but haven't yet made a decision to go you know, full force into something like that as like a, a segment of our product or something. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, in the last slide, you mentioned that you want to improve the quality time of the viewer. So, do you have any idea of how do you measure when the user is having a quality time versus just, a, like, you mentioned that maybe you just slap through the watch? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, quality time. How do we get better at measuring quality viewing um, or intentional viewing? So, we have taken some steps to um, come up with a few clarifying signals that get at intentional viewing, but the challenge is you don't want to ding people for the for what we think might be unintentional. You know, there's so much uncertainty around that and so many plausible explanations for sort of background viewing or whatever. And also some people may really enjoy that viewing. Um, so essentially what I would say is for different parts of the recommender system, we do have some signals here and there depending on the particular algorithm that are accommodating some of these like intentional viewing um, signals. And then uh, and then our group does a lot of retention modeling, lifetime value modeling, and trying to understand how different behaviors correlate with, with retention and tenure. And sometimes we've uncovered things that have helped us brainstorm another signal you know, to try in the recommender system around that. Time for one or two more questions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the cold start problem for a new user to Netflix, how do we try to get the recommendation right? We have done um, quite a bit of work in that area over the past couple of years. Um, uh, one of my colleagues, Car Carlos gomez Uribe, has really you know, kind of championed that area to really move it forward. And our algorithm engineering group, um, which does a lot of the core machine learning um, work, has done a lot of things. And so some of the steps we've taken are when a new member joins, we have something called the on-ramp. Um, which uh, it's harder for you if you're already a Netflix member, you're not going to see it, but you would, you, we show a collection of familiar titles or known titles that are quite diverse in, in uh, what they're representing. And we ask folks to just like check some boxes, check titles you've liked or watched. And that gives us a ton of information to get going. Um, so that's been super useful. We also, uh, you know, clustering can really help. So if we just know a tiny bit about somebody, we can really relate them to other um, clusters around the tastes um, of our member base, and so that has helped too. Um, so it, it's, and the, what I would say is, as soon as we get one play from uh, uh, somebody, we can actually do quite a good job on the recommendations, and it just, uh, you know, um, accelerates, improves ex exponentially from there. With one play, two plays, three plays, you know, we really have a decent picture of the kinds of things um, to show. One yes. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Presentation bias. Uh, yeah, obviously there's no perfect way to handle presentation bias. We do try to inject a tiny bit of variety, um, uh, like low on the page or just very occasionally to members to gather a tiny bit of data that helps us remove some of that presentation bias. It's, it's a long-standing problem. We also, another way we tackle it, frankly, is by um, having the, f the fact that we have multiple algorithms that contribute to the personalization and the fact that we have an entire page to work with that you can then scroll through is a benefit, right? Like it's a fortunate part of our problem. If we were just showing you one title at a time, it would be a huge problem, I think. But because we can show a lot of variety on that page with different algorithms that are prioritizing different types of features, um, that takes care of some amount of the problem as well. And then we, another, another thing we do, by the way, is you know, the regions are helpful because we've got essentially different catalogs in different regions, um, a lot of var variety uh, across. We would love to have one global catalog, but let's, let's face it, it's going to be like decades before we can get there just because of the ecosystem um, of content. But, but the, the fact that we have different um, 
catalogs in different regions helps us with the tastes and understanding tastes and how to uh, cluster them essentially globally in ways that help us remove some of that. But we, we don't have an explicit way, like we're not going to show you know, some, some members like a totally random set of titles so that we can get the data to fully remove the presentation bias, because we wouldn't feel good about that. Like we're not going to do something like that. Yeah, it's a hard problem. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.